Well, it's good to see you all this morning. Um, uh, a couple things. One is that, uh, um, obviously good to have Dave and Simona back. We've missed them. If you don't know Dave and Simona, they are both uh, come from PBA one way or another. Simona was a professor and Dave graduated there and they've been a huge part of our ministry. And those of you that do know them, we've missed them greatly. So it's so good to have you back, Dave, Simona, Elliot, everybody. Um, also, uh, one thing um, some of you have been asking about, and uh, we decided we'd try something. This will be um, something a little bit new. It's not new to the scriptures, because Jesus did it all the time. But uh, we are going to try and uh, put together a couple different small group uh, opportunities for people when they come here, or you that are new here, um, that just uh, provides an element where um, some of our longest standing uh, core people around the ministry can help newer people assimilate into the church. So if you're new and you're trying to figure out how to assimilate in quickly or want to just um, find some new solid friendships of godly young people that will challenge you to grow, um, we've just put together about four different small groups. Um, Tim will send out the information. Um, They basically meet at four different homes. Mark's home, Ethan's home, Mary Haskell's, and the Chickasaw House. Um, Some of them... (laughs) Yeah, some, some of them are going to go through different books. Others are just going to talk about the sermons that week and just talk about the implications and pray for one another. So if you're interested in something like that, interested in a little more close-range uh, time to talk ministry, talk truth, talk discipleship, um, Tim will be the one on the email. If you're not on the email list, um, Tim, where are you? This is Tim. Stand up. If you'd like to get emails that lets you know what's going on in our ministry, go see Tim. He is the one to go see. So that will be starting up here soon. Nothing extra, extra formal about it. Just an opportunity for us to encourage one another more. I know a lot of you are involved in Friday night Bible studies and other Bible studies. Don't feel like you need to leave those to come to this. Um, serve where you're at. And even these small groups... I'm having trouble here. Sorry. These small groups... Uh, will be an opportunity where the group can go serve the church in different capacities. So the groups might find different needs and just go meet needs in the church. So it's just another opportunity to minister to one another. So see Tim for that. All right, if you would, open your Bibles back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. If you have not been with us, uh, we have been uh, uh, on quite the journey so far, three sermons in or so, in the... Book of Acts. I know many of you have come up to me and said, I'm so excited about this study because Acts is one of those books that's been a bit of an anomaly to me. Many of you have not read it, as many many other books, but as I've been telling you the last few weeks, to understand Acts is really to have one hand on the Gospels and one hand on the rest of the New Testament letters and be able to see all that connects them. It's really to understand Acts. But what we've been looking at, and I think it'll be important for us to think about again this morning, is what is going on in Acts 1 when Jesus starts spending a good bit of time, in fact, sorry, the last 40 days of His ministry, talking to His disciples about the kingdom. Talking to His disciples about the kingdom. And I said to you something interesting to think about. If you were to come up with in your mind what Jesus would spend His last 40 days. I mean, think about that. Jesus Christ, the God-man, He spent 33 years roughly on this earth, three years ministering to His disciples. He's about to send them off and lead His earthly ministry and go to His heavenly ministry. And the thing that was most predominantly on Jesus' mind that He needed to get into the minds of His disciples was an understanding of the kingdom. An understanding of the kingdom. Look at Acts 1.3. Look at what it says. To these, being His disciples, He presented Himself alive after His suffering. So this is post-cross and resurrection. By many convincing proofs, appearing to them over 40 days. So we've got a 40-day seminar going on right here with His disciples. What in the world would Jesus spend His time preaching teaching, discipling, q and aing on for 40 days before He left. Speaking to them of the things concerning the kingdom. Concerning the kingdom. And in fact, if you go down a little bit farther, just before He left 
to His ascension back to heaven before His second coming, the most pressing question on the disciples' mind was, when is this kingdom you've been talking about us to us about going to return? Notice verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking Him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So I want you to think about something. I want you to back up for a second. I don't know where everybody's at in this room. We go from the most mature to the honest inquirer and somewhere in between. But when you think about Jesus and He's trying to equip His disciples. Now think about this. He's trying to send them in to a season of their life where they will not be with Him anymore. He's going to send them the Spirit to permanently indwell them, to seal them for a power that they can have in their ministry. But He's trying to not just equip them, we might say, but if you were going to go into a time or you were going to talk to someone, they were going to go into a time where it was going to be threatening. It was going to be difficult. They were going to need courage. They were going to become discouraged. They were probably going to lose their life. I mean, if a military commander was going to tell his soldiers that knew they were going to lose their life, a last charge, what would he talk to them about? That's this kind of discussion. And so in that sense, this discussion on the kingdom becomes very practical if you think about it. Because if this was the thing Jesus wanted most on His disciples' minds so that they could go into the church age from Acts 2 on and be faithful to Him, then this is something we really, really, really need to understand. This means that He wanted His disciples to have a deep and profound grasp of the kingdom, knowing that they were going to need serious convictions if they were going to be those that stood when persecution came and difficulty came and they were going to be faithful. They needed a farewell sermons on the kingdom. You know what I love about this? If you fast forward to Acts 17.6, in the book of Acts. There's a little line, one of my favorite lines in the book of Acts. In fact, if we could ever do a conference, I'd want to name it this. Because he says here that the disciples were known by those that upset the world. What if we had a conference called Upsetting the World? That'd be a good conference. Lots of conferences are trying to court the world. These men were known as those men that upset the world. Just listen to Acts 17.6. They were dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men, so he's saying, these men that are standing here, these men we've brought before you, they have upset the world. The ESV says this, these men have turned the world upside down. So, fast forward, 17.6. Now, rewind back to Jesus' discussion on the kingdom. We might say the discussion on the kingdom for Jesus was what was going to equip them to be the type of people that would upset the world for the gospel. Now, don't you want to be known as that? Because when you say upset the world, what he's saying is in the wake of these people's lives was spiritual usefulness, souls being saved, the gospel being preached, holy lives. Anytime they would go somewhere, lives would be changed and the lost world would go... Man, I don't know what it is about them. I don't really like it. But when people interact with them, lives are changed. So you might say this, that if you want to be known as someone that upsets the world, then we ought to be thinking about what Jesus wanted on the disciples' minds so that they could upset the world. When we say upset the world, we don't mean offend them unnecessarily or be unkind. We mean such a robust gospel testimony that the culture says these guys are making a dent in society just by preaching their message and living their lives. So when we talk about the kingdom, if you're anything like me, you probably have not thought enough about the last 40 days Jesus spent with His disciples and the main topic being the kingdom. So, Here's what we're going to do this morning in our time. We are going to talk about the main features that probably would have been there in that discussion when Jesus talked to them for these 40 days. Now, we've got 40 minutes. There's no way we could make up for all that Jesus would say in 40 days, right? But we can be assured if you look at all of the Scriptures, and we're going to go a lot of places here in a moment, that we can cover the main ground, the main features that Jesus would have wanted on their minds. And beloved, if you tune in this morning, I'm telling you, you are going to leave so massively encouraged for greater usefulness to the Lord. Because if Jesus wanted this on the disciples' mind to make them useful, then He wants it on our minds to make us useful. So if you're taking notes, here it is. Four kingdom realities that Jesus would have taught the disciples during His final 40 days 
on earth. Four kingdom realities that Jesus would have taught His disciples during His final 40 days on earth. And I'll tell you what, the kingdom becomes exceedingly practical by the time we're done today. So hang with me. As we go through this, you are going to see this connects literally to how you live today. So, first, first kingdom reality is this. He currently universally reigns from heaven. He currently universally reigns from heaven. Turn to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. If we're thinking what would have been on Jesus' lips, He certainly would have been speaking to them in some degree or another about His kingdom reign and how it was in a universal sense. How it was in a universal sense sense. Now here's what's interesting about this. As you're turning there, book of Daniel, chapter 4. Oftentimes when we say the term kingdom, and I say kingdom, you associate a lot of things in your mind. And I associate things in my mind. But you have to understand, when the term the kingdom is used in the scriptures... You've got a universal sense that's speaking about God's sovereign authority. And then our next point, he's got a futuristic sense that's talking about when he returns with his kingdom. You've got to hear this point. If you flatten out every kingdom passage and just make it about his universal sovereignty, you're going to miss much of the point of your New Testament. So this first point is crucial because Jesus would have been saying to them, men, disciples, there is a universal sense to my kingdom, but it's actually use the minority of the time. But let's just look at it. He currently universally reigns from heaven. Jesus currently universally reigns from heaven. Daniel 4, 34 and 35. Now in this context, when you come here, it's phenomenal. I encourage you to go read it. But you got Nebuchadnezzar, who thought he was really something, got proud, started to boast, looked at his kingdom and said, look how great I am. God said, oh, you think you can run a kingdom? I'm going to basically turn you into uh, a patient that we would Baker Act today, send you out to eat with the animals for the next seven years, and then we'll see think if you think you're so great. And on the heels of that humbling by the Lord, here's what Nebuchadnezzar's testimony begins to say about God. Daniel chapter 4, 34 through 35. But at the end of this period, that is after God sent him seven years out to live with the animals... I, Nebuchadnezzar, raise my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him who lives forever. Notice this. For His dominion, there's kingdom language, is everlasting dominion. And His kingdom, that is His universal sovereign kingdom, it endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing that's in comparison to Him. But He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off His hand or say to Him, What have you done? This passage is describing the universal reign of King of Kings. You could say King Jesus, God on the throne, Jesus on the throne reigning from heaven. So when we speak about the kingdom, some passages you run into are going to be about Jesus' sovereign, universal reign over everything. That's an important thing to bring up front. And that's encouraging to us, right? It's comforting when we hit trials, when we hit difficulties. We like to know our king is on the throne. We don't like to imagine God is spinning out of control or when we're in a trial, he's up in heaven biting his nails, wondering what's going to happen next. We're comforted by these thoughts. And so that's true. When you think of the kingdom, think universal reign, Jesus on the throne, reigning and ruling over everything. But his last 40-day seminar, go back to Acts 1, was not primarily on that. His last 40-day seminar was not primarily on His universal and sovereign reign. His last 40-day seminar is our second point. He currently universally reigns, but His seminar in Acts 1 is that He will soon mediatorily reign on earth. He will soon mediatorily reign on earth. They're not talking about His universal reign. Notice, we know that, Because once he's done talking, look back in verse 6 again. They're not asking about his universal reign. They're talking about his reign that is still to come. Notice, so when they had come together, verse 6 of chapter 1, they were asking him, saying, Lord, 
is it the time for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're not asking about his universal reign. They know that's genuine. They know he's on the throne. They're asking about when he's going to return and mediate his rule on earth. How do we know that? Because he says to them, verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So the second kingdom reality that would have filled Jesus' sermons these last 40 days would have been this. He's going to have a mediatorial reign, and I'll describe that in a second, when He returns. And when I say mediatorially, what I mean is this. It, it's the idea of Him mediating His rule on the earth. He's, he's displaying His authority and power. As some call it, you've got His universal kingdom and His particular kingdom. So when we say mediate, we're just saying there's going to be a time that he was talking to the disciples about a lot, where he's going to return and he's going to rule and reign on the earth. That's this kingdom. And listen, most of your passages in your New Testament and your Old that speak of the kingdom are speaking of this kingdom. The one that is to come when King Jesus comes back and sets up his throne. But you understand what would happen if you flatten those out. If you start looking at futuristic kingdom passages as universal kingdom passages, then you're going to miss some of the distinction that Jesus wants us to think about. It's a mediatorial kingdom where He's going to rule and reign over His people. Look at Acts 3, 17 and 20. It comes up again in the book of Acts. They're wondering about the coming kingdom. Acts 3. Look what He says. And now brethren, verse 17. Now brethren, I know that you have acted in ignorance just as the rulers did also. But the things would God announce beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that Christ would suffer and this would be fulfilled. So he looks back. Look at this. Therefore, repent and return so your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That times of refreshing, that turn, that's all kingdom language from the Old Testament. They're still looking forward based on Israel's repentance for Jesus to return. In fact, you know that in Luke 14, 15, when Jesus is speaking to His disciples, He doesn't talk to them about His universal reign. When He's reclining with them at the table, He talks to them about His second coming, His earthly reign, when He's going to mediate His authority. He says this, When one of these were reclining at the table with Him, they heard, He said to them, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. If He was talking about His universal kingdom... He wouldn't be talking about in the future they're going to eat bread with Him. He's talking about when He returns and sets up His earthly kingdom. Do you know that in Mark 15, Joseph of Arimathea, you know, when he shows up there at the empty tomb, we all love that story. Do you know what was most concerning to Joseph of Arimathea? The coming kingdom. Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council. He himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Luke 23, 39 to 42, you can go look it up again. Same thing. You know what's interesting about the thief on the cross? And this is probably for another sermon. But have you ever looked at the thief on the cross's language on what he was putting his hope in and what he was anticipating? One of the criminals were hanging there and they basically scolded him and rebuked him. Look at this. Don't even, he said, do you even not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And he said, and we indeed are suffering justly, the other criminal, for we are receiving what we deserve from our deeds. This is the thief on the cross. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's pointing to Jesus. And he was saying this, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. I want to be there when you return and restore all that you've promised. When is his coming? We don't know in the future. What happens in his coming? And this is important. And you'll, you'll understand in a moment why I'm getting all these details. When the earthly return of Christ comes and He mediates His earthly kingdom, that triggers a number of things in your Bible. It triggers a number of things in terms of promises from old and promises that are to come. Like Revelation 20, a millennial kingdom gets set up. So if you are to say the kingdom is still to come and we're waiting for it, then you're simultaneously saying, I'm waiting for the millennium. To say we're currently in the millennium now, you're simultaneously saying we're currently in a place where Jesus is mediating His rule and reign. So Revelation 20 kicks in, and there's a, a thousand-year 
millennial kingdom. And then there's an eternal kingdom that comes after that, after the great wars and the battles when Jesus reigns over all and removes all wickedness from His kingdom. Jesus, at that time also, when the kingdom comes, fulfills all of His promises to Israel. God didn't pull an audible. He didn't promise a bunch of things to Israel and look like the play wasn't going to work and say, I'm going to have to change this a little bit. Let's pull an audible and do something different. You understand, you non-football people, an audible is you change your play. (laughs) Jesus is not a bad communicator and He doesn't need to change His plan. He made promises to Israel that were land promises, political promises, geographical promises, blessings for the nation. And they pull in other nations, but those He doesn't need to pull an audible. When the kingdom comes, those are going to be established. I'll show you that in a moment. So, He's got a future return that is going to come. And you may say, okay, how do I square up universal kingdom with this mediatorial kingdom? Well, one author says this, and it's, it's right to say. He says, While most kingdom passages focused on God's mediatorial kingdom on earth, God's universal kingdom is always in operation. He is always in control and always prevails. For though men resist God's mediatorial kingdom plans, they never escape His universal rule. The goal for all of this is that God will bring into perfect conformity His universal kingdom with His mediatorial kingdom. So now let's go back to those 40 days. Okay? Here's Jesus spending all kinds of time talking to His disciples about the kingdom that is not yet come. The kingdom that they need to look forward to. And in those discussions, He would have been talking to them about passages. Listen, just listen. Leviticus 26. If Israel would confess their iniquity, then I'll remember my covenant and I'll remember their land. He's giving them hope. Promises. You've got to understand, all through your Old Testament, all through the prophets, prophecy after prophecy is looking towards a coming kingdom, full restoration. So you think, well, why would Jesus be spending so much time having them look toward what was to come before He launched them out to their ministry? You can go read Jeremiah 3, 12-18. I'd encourage you to put it down. It's another great passage on Jesus that would have put in their mind during these 40 days. Or how about 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14? Listen to what Jesus would have probably talked to them about. If I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins and I will restore to them. So what is going on here? You understand, the kingdom was presented in the Gospels, right? Again and again, you hear, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. So Jesus presents the kingdom. It's near. John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom is coming. Again and again, all through, you got right, the kingdom's at hand. So the offer of the kingdom and all the promises and everything that's given, it's offered, and Israel stiff arms it and rejects it. So He would have wanted them to see. You understand, guys, in this sovereign plan, disciples, that I came to deliver the kingdom, but it was contingent on repentance, and my own people rejected me. And so I took the kingdom and took it back up to heaven with me. I left with the kingdom. If you just want to think, how can you be certain, Darren, that He came with His kingdom and then He left with His kingdom? He offered it, and why did He want them to know that? And then He took it away. Two passages. Matthew 4.17. Okay? Just look at it real quick. Matthew 4.17. Just hang with me on these details. We're going to get to something that's going to encourage you in a moment. Greatly. Notice Matthew 4.17. From the time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom is heaven is at hand. Now listen to me. When Israel would have heard that, it would have been dripping with all of the promises of the Old Testament. If they would have repented, in their minds it would have signified Jesus is going to come and set up His earthly throne and mediate His reign and remove all wickedness and restore our land and restore our temple. And there's going to be peace and jubilee. And Isaiah chapter 9 that says the government will rest on His shoulders. And He's King of Kings. Our favorite Christmas Uh, Isaiah part of Isaiah is a kingdom passage. If they would have repented, he would have set that all up. But they rejected it. And we know that because he starts his ministry saying, the kingdom's at hand. And then in Luke 21, you don't have to go there, 
But if you look right there at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, 17, the kingdom of hand, in Luke 21, 27 to 31, he says, the kingdom of God is near in reference to his second coming. He presents the message of the kingdom. They reject it. He pulls it back and says, the kingdom will come when I come back. Presented and rejected. So this 40-day class with the disciples would have had all types of language about it being presented and then being rejected. Look at Amos 9, 11 to 15. Amos 9. It's in your minor prophets. It's just before Obadiah. <laughs> if you can get to Jonah, you'll be in the ballpark. Just after Hosea. Now you're saying, Darren, why are you giving us all these details about Israel? Why are you giving us all these details about, we know for certain that the, the actual reign of the king has not yet come, that they're waiting for it. Why would he want this in the disciples' mind? And how does this help us think about all that God would want to do through the book of Acts? Well, did you know that in God's kingdom program, before his return, Revelation 5 says he wants people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to be around the throne worshiping him. And all the way back, in Israel's time, they should have been a godlier nation because he wanted what he was going to do with them to splash over all the nations because God's about saving nationally and internationally and every tribe, tongue, and nation. There's no discrimination. And Amos 9 talks about that. So now you've got these disciples sitting there and clearly he would have said, Men, let's go back and look at the prophecy of Amos because my people may have rejected me, but I still got a plan for the nations. Look at Amos 9. Start in verse 11. This is so encouraging. Amos 9, verse 11. Notice, In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David. This is in the day I bring back my kingdom. The one that you're wondering about. And I will wall up its breaches, and I will raise up its ruins, and I will rebuild it in the days of old, and they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations who are... Look at this. And all the nations... Who is that? All the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord. He just took the message to Israel and took it beyond the borders of Israel and said, God's plan is to redeem people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes will, who sow seed, when the mountains will drip with sweet wine. This is all when Jesus returns and sets up His mediatorial kingdom. And the hills will be dissolved and I will restore the captivity of my people Israel and I will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them and they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and they'll make gardens and eat their fruit and they will plant on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I gave them. That is the promise to Israel that was given to them and so when Jesus said repent for the kingdom can come that's what would have happened but they rejected and God even has in this I've still got a plan for the nations. So let's back up again. Why so much emphasis on the life to come? Why so much emphasis on the life to come? Well, if you're going to go into a hard season, and you're going to go into difficulty, and you're a disciple, and you're going into the, to the difficulty that's going to be the launching of the church, Jesus knew nothing would be more important than two things. You knew my promises were true, and I will fulfill them. And in the meantime, before I come back and set up my mediatorial kingdom, I need you to realize that this earth is not your home and the promises that I've made will be fulfilled. And do not attach yourself to this earth. It's like Dr. John MacArthur says, a true believer throws their anchor into heaven and locks in there. The reason Jesus spent so much time on the kingdom is because when the kingdom comes, you understand, friends, it's all going to be restored. No more sickness. No more difficulty. No more battles. No more cancer. No more broken relationships. No more hostility. No more phone calls that rock your world. No more colds. No more disease. No more snooze. <laughs> no more pain and suffering. No more frailness of mind. No more fleeting thoughts. No more long days at work with little reward. No more car accidents. No more fear of man. Jesus wanted to put their minds on the fulfillment of His promises because until He comes through much tribulation, their life is going to be difficult. So Jesus knew what makes you useful now is not focusing on the now and trying to extract all you can from this life. It's knowing that a day is going to come where Jesus is going to dissolve all of this and reestablish it and bring a new kingdom and bring His people into it. And He wanted them thinking of that day. It gives them perspective. I want to read you something that will be a great encouragement 
from Dr. Michael Vlock on why thinking of the kingdom with this much detail ought to encourage our hearts. And beloved, let this encourage you. You say, there's so many things to learn about the kingdom and so many details and he spent 40 days. Well, you can be for certain. There's nothing that will fuel your fire for faithfulness to the Lord more than knowing that this earth can't satisfy. (laughs) That you can extract all you want from it, but there's always going to be a void. I mean, everything that we try and grind out of this earth is limited and it's God's common grace so often and we get to enjoy so many blessings of it. But He wanted His disciples to realize, guys, go spend yourself for souls in the book of Acts and live for the kingdom because anything you try and accumulate here is going to burn up anyways and I'm going to reestablish it in a much better way. Listen to Michael Vlock. The kingdom of God is not just an interesting academic pursuit for me. It is intensely personal and practical. It's the basis of my hope and the solution to everything wrong in the world. Every frustration, fear, and doubt can be answered by the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's all temporary. No matter what suffering you're in today, no matter what difficulty, no matter if you get a a diagnosis for cancer or your friend rejects you because you preach the gospel to him. One day, friends, the kingdom's going to come back. And he knew that if his disciples did not have long-range focus and know that Jesus wins in the end, the discouragement now would be too much. Michael Vlock says, I get it. It's hard. He says, my heart longs for the kingdom. I think about its coming daily. He says this, if statistics are correct, I am well within the latter half of my lifespan. Both of my parents have passed away. One of my sisters recently succumbed to the cruel fatal disease. It seems as if every month I hear of someone diagnosed with cancer or some life-threatening situation. My experiences certainly are not unique. The world my children are inheriting seems to worsen daily. Increasingly, good is called evil and evil is considered good. Traditional values are mocked. Even the creation ordinance like marriage has been redefined. Yet in spite of that sober and disappointing realities, I love life because it's from God's common grace. Life is full of excitement, color, activity. The thought of not being able to participate in life with all its beauty and relationships is depressing if I take my eyes off Jesus for a moment. But he says this, I think of the haunting words of the atheist Christopher Hitchens who hopelessly said before he died it will happen to all of us that at some point you'll be tapped on the shoulder and told not just the party is over but slightly worse the party has gone on but you have to leave he says this I too don't want the party to end I want life but also I don't want this fallen and tragically soaked world to continue forever either so I find myself conflicted I love being alive in God's creation yet I'm grieved and frustrated by the fallen and dangerous world I think this reality of being a son of the kingdom in the age before the kingdom actually he says I think of the reality of being a son of the kingdom in the age of the kingdom before it actually arrives if you know Jesus your desires are probably similar you love life You love God's creation and many good things He's given you. Yet, you are frustrated because of the broken world. You too have a heart for God's kingdom, even if you have not thought of it in those terms. That is why Christians need to understand God's kingdom plan. When you study the kingdom, you are examining the grand theme of Scripture and the solution for all that is wrong. End quote. Everything that's broken is going to be fixed. So He launches out these disciples into the church. All of them are going to die for their faith. Think about that. He knows that. What's going to give them the courage to stand when they're going to crucify them, lop off their heads, hang them upside down, beat them, marginalize them? It's okay. What a privilege to suffer now when the kingdom's coming. My Jesus has me. I'm a son of the kingdom. Even if every earthly possession is ripped from me, the future kingdom's still going to come. It's going to be reinstated and all God's promises are going to be fulfilled. You know what else that means? That leads us into our third point. I'm going to finish them out. We've got about 10 minutes. They'll unfold. But just think about this. His currently, he currently universally reigns from heaven. He will soon mediatorially reign on earth. That is such an encouragement. Just let that sink into your heart this week when you're tempted to imagine this world can satisfy you. That the king of the universe will return and when he comes back, he'll, he'll fix all that's broken. And in the meantime, <laughs> live for him and don't hold on to this earth so tightly because it's all going to be consumed and reestablished in his glory. Third, here's what he wanted them to know. His followers were currently spiritual kingdom citizens. His followers were currently current spiritual kingdom citizens. Do you know that 
in all this difficulty? Do you know that at the courthouse of heaven that your name has been written there? And if, if they were to take a, an audit or they were to take an inventory on who is a citizen of heaven, if you're a son of the kingdom and you've trusted in the coming kingdom, then at the courthouse of heaven, your name is written as one who will be an inheritor of all that I just described per jubilee and bliss. Philippians 3.17, our citizenship is in heaven. That is to say, I currently live in this fallen earth, but my actual residency is the kingdom in heaven. Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom. Think about this, Colossians 1.13, for He rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us, listen, into the kingdom of His beloved Son. That means He transferred you into a person that's going to be a recipient of all the kingdom promises. Listen to that language. He rescued you, pulled you out of darkness and wickedness, and then did a direct prisoner transfer to kingdom status. Now think about that for a second. That's like saying a cruel hardened criminal is serving his time in prison. He deserves to be there. He's guilty. He should be in prison. He earned it. He deserved it. He knows it. Everyone knows it. An innocent comes and pays an exorbitant fee to break him out and rescue him. There's the language. To pull him out of where he belongs. But rather than just putting him in a car when that prisoner walks out of prison <laughs> and driving him to the nearest city so he can reestablish life or whatever it may be, he puts him on a jet and flies him to the nicest kingdoms in the world and puts him up there and says, you get to reign with the king for the rest of your life. That's what it means to be a kingdom citizen. He rescued them from the dominion of darkness and transferred them into His kingdom of His beloved Son. You say, well, I don't feel like that now. I definitely don't have a palace. And my life does not feel like I'm reigning and ruling over anything. That's because it's a spiritual reality now that you believe by faith. And when God comes back in His mediatorial kingdom, that will all be re realized. So he certainly in his 40-day seminar would have wanted them to know, guys, you're kingdom citizens. This earth is not your home. Stop trying to get so much out of it and live for the kingdom that is the city to come. As Hebrews says, you have a city that is not yet come. I think that's in Hebrews chapter 11 maybe. Lastly, our fourth point. Not only that, not only is the kingdom universal, not only is the kingdom mediatorial, not only would he have wanted them to know they're currently kingdom citizens and have hope in that, the last one is this. The fourth kingdom reality is his followers had an obligation to preach the kingdom. To preach the kingdom. Just, just listen for a moment of how many passages speak about preaching the kingdom. You probably think, I'm going to preach the gospel. And that's true, you should preach the gospel. But let me make an appeal to you. Preach the gospel under the banner of the kingdom. Of the coming kingdom. Listen, Acts 8.12. They went out preaching the kingdom. Acts 14.22. They were encouraging them in their faith and preaching the kingdom. Acts 19. They went out boldly reasoning and preaching the kingdom. Acts 20 verse 5. They went out preaching the kingdom. Acts 28.3. They went out and were testifying about the kingdom. Acts 28.31. They were preaching the kingdom. What kingdom are they speaking about? The mediatorial kingdom? The one that's still going to come back? Here's Jesus' ministry. Matthew 4.23. He went through Galilee and the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 9.35. He went from city to city in the synagogue preaching the kingdom. Luke 9.60. Matthew 24.14. Luke 8.1. And on and on and on. Jesus' first message. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 10.7. And as you go preach the kingdom. So, you say, what in the world is a kingdom gospel? I mean, we read those passages and we just import what we understand about the gospel. And that's true, we should. But a kingdom gospel, you understand, that removes all man-centeredness. Think about it. You're not going to talk about a returning king that people are going to have to give an account to in a man-centered gospel. So often today, many of you come from churches like this, where the center of the gospel story, the hero is the person. And they're so wonderful that God must be obligated to save such a wonderful person. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so since you're so amazing, God's going to shower His blessings on you. A gospel of the kingdom says this. There is a, there is a king that came. <laughs> His name was Jesus. And He came and died even though He was a king for rebellious sinners. You owe Him your life 
He rules and reigns and you are obligated to worship Him. And currently in your condition, if you don't worship the King, then you're not worshiping the Sovereign of the universe. And if you're not worshiping Him now, when He returns, if you're not worshiping Him, then you won't meet Him as suffering servant. You'll meet Him as sovereign King to bring judgment. When they preached the kingdom, they were saying to people, and that Israel would have known and all the people, the kingdom gospel is this. Jesus offers salvation. He offers forgiveness. He offers cleansing if you repent. But He is Lord and He is King. And He will bring in to full retribution every single person that won't come under His rule. King Jesus will be your substitute if you'll repent of your rebellion. But that means if we're going to preach, we must preach like them because they said, repent for the kingdoms at hand. That is to say to people, you trust in Jesus as the Messiah. He is the King and come under Him. But if you don't, He could come at any moment. And when He comes the second time, Revelation 19 says, a sword's coming out of His mouth. He's got blood on His feet. He's coming on a white horse. And the old Jesus that came as suffering servant, He offered the Gospel. Next time He comes with the Kingdom, He's declaring judgment. You see the difference? So when they were preaching the Kingdom, they weren't saying, Ah, oh, you're so wonderful. They're saying, God is wonderful. He's amazing. He is king. He deserves your worship. And right now, you're on your own throne. You call yourself king. You declare yourself king. You live for yourself. The kingdom gospel says, repent of your self-autonomy, jump off your throne, fall at His feet, beg for Him to forgive you, and declare your allegiance to Him as king, and live for Him that way, and you'll have an inheritance in the kingdom. To reject that message, you'll face Him with no opportunity. It's the expiration date of the gospel in His second coming. No longer an offering. The book of Acts is full of preaching the kingdom gospel. I think we could go out and say, what are you going to do? I'm going to go preach the gospel of the kingdom. What do you mean by that? I mean there's good news that Jesus came as a suffering servant and died and rose. But when He comes back, He's going to reinstate His full kingdom. And there will be no wickedness in His kingdom, no sinners in His kingdom, only believers in His kingdom. So if you're not a believer, you're not going to be a son of the kingdom. You won't be there. You need to repent before He comes back. Turn from your sin and throw yourself on Him for mercy because the King is coming. Now that is a God-centered gospel. You know what Jesus says in John 3? Jesus answers to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is so desperate. Give me a way to leak into the kingdom without having to repent of myself. Let me sneak to you at night in John 3. Jesus, teacher, let me into the kingdom. Is there a, a four-step process? Jesus says to him, Truly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We're calling people to be born again. You say, well, they can't make themselves born again. Of course. But they can cry out and ask God, the King, to save them, and He's never turned down a sinner. I mean, you think about that. So now go back to the 40-day seminar. He's telling the disciples, guys, you have a job. And while I leave you here on earth, before I bring back my kingdom, you go preach the kingdom gospel. And you preach it hard, and you preach it firm, and you don't, you don't care about the earthly consequences, because every single person that rejects you, you don't care what they think of you. You fear for the day when the king returns, and they've established themselves on the throne, and he comes back and wipes them off their throne, and sits up in heaven and says, you rejected me. I am the king. You had an offering into the judgment. Man. You want to talk about motivating these disciples. They had some work to do. No wonder those guys didn't fear man. All that they were focused on was the king's return. Now you see why thinking about the mediatorial kingdom drives even evangelism. My God deserves your worship and he, I want you to be in His kingdom. You need to repent so you can be in it. Four kingdom realities. Think about them again. Jesus probably would have taught His disciples during the 40-day seminar on the kingdom. He currently universally reigns. He will soon mediatorially reign on earth. His followers are currently spiritually kingdom citizens. And His followers' obligation is to preach the kingdom. You cannot have a man-centered gospel with a kingdom gospel because you'll tell a sinner, if you don't repent, you're going to face him. <laughs> so, how do we wrap that all up for us? Guys, what an encouraging thing to think about as a believer. No matter how broken this life becomes for you, you've got the coming kingdom where your king is going to reign. And Revelation 1.6 says you're going to reign with him. Think about that today to be encouraged. If you get discouraged by whatever trials are in your life, just think, my Jesus is going to set up the kingdom. In the meantime, 
I want as many people around the throne as possible there with me in the kingdom. So I want to preach the king's gospel to everybody I can. And in the meantime, when I get discouraged and lose hope, I can remind myself I'm a spiritual kingdom citizen and I can't wait for the full restoration of that. You want to talk to someone on their dying bed, they're not going to care what they accomplished in life. They're going to want to know that they're a son of the kingdom because they're about to face Him and they want to be a part of that. Amen? So let's be going into the book of Acts with that 40-day seminar on our mind. And next week, Matt Johnson is going to talk about preaching the kingdom in Italy. And then we're going to come back and we're going to be in the book of Acts watching the gospel explode. And if you go, how do these men have such courage and conviction and hope? Just go back to the 40-day seminar. Because the coming kingdom motivated the disciples to be men that upset the world. Is that amazing? Let's pray. Lord, we pray as you taught the disciples. We forget this prayer. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. We trust your universal reign, but we, we, us that love you, confess sometimes we fear your return because we're so attached to this earth. But it's, it's kingdom realities like this that help us see that this earth is temporary. It's fleeting. And that what matters most is that we're a son of you and that we'll be in your future kingdom. I just think about a, a residency with you for eternity in your kingdom. Is a small, it's a small price to play to suffer here, but those that want to extract all they can and live for the world now and then spend eternity paying for their sin, what a price tag. Lord, I, I pray anybody here this morning that doesn't think they're ready to meet King Jesus, Jesus, when you come back, if they're not ready to meet you and they haven't dethroned themselves and pledged allegiance to you on their throne and if they're so caught up in the world that they don't even think about kingdom realities, I pray you would crush their pride and help them see that nothing matters more in their life that they're ready to face the king and that they could be a son of the kingdom and they could know the hope and encouragement we all have because this life fails us regularly. We have broken bodies and we anticipate heaven. We will be with you in your kingdom. And we want to be like the disciples that live for the life to come, not be so desperate to extract all our happiness from this life. We love you, Lord Jesus. Send us into Luke's Gospel with Pastor Jerry today, anxious to hear about your ministry, Jesus, as we await your coming kingdom. So come, Lord Jesus. Come soon. And those that don't know you, I pray they'd repent so they're